This episode of Literary Treks is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and to help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. Hey everyone, I'm Rod Roddenberry and you're listening to Trek FM. taking all these books? I thought I'd take some light reading, in case I got bored. Welcome, everyone, to a special episode of Literary Treks. This is episode number 276, and I guess that's a little redundant, because I think of every episode that we do as special. Uh, And what makes it really special is, of course, my wonderful co-host, Bruce Gibson, who is joining me as always. Bruce, how's it going this evening? Ah, shucks. Don't call me wonderful, but I'm doing great. I'm just doing well. Excellent. Well, there's another reason this episode is special, because we don't have a traditional feature in this episode that we, you know, we usually cover like a book or a comic or something like that. But we're doing something a little bit different, and I hope you'll bear with us. We're going to talk a little bit about... A Star Wars what, novel. Star Wars novel, no. exactly. No, that's our April 1st episode we're doing that. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit about what goes into making a Star Trek novel, how the experts write a Star Trek novel, and kind of that whole process. And we've got a couple of special guests that are going to help us with that. But before we get to there... We are going to talk a bit of Star Trek news. We have a bunch of Star Trek news this week, and we have a comic that we're going to review. Uh, So first of all, uh, some interesting news came out recently. We're recording this the week after the Shore Leave Convention, where traditionally a bunch of the Star Trek authors get together. There's a good presence of them there. And Usually there's some news from the Star Trek book world that comes out from that as well. And this year was no exception. We got news of a new Discovery novel, and that is coming on December 17th, Star Trek Discovery Dead Endless by Dave Gallanter. Uh, Now, Dave Gallanter is one of my favorite Star Trek authors. He's written a few books that I really love. My absolute favorite of his is Troublesome Minds. I think that's a great novel. If you haven't read it, go read it. Um, yes. But yeah, this novel centers on Paul Stamets and takes place during uh, actual the actual mission of the USS Discovery, which makes it the first novel under the Star Trek Discovery title to actually do this. That's kind of cool. Oh, it is because we yeah, we never get Discovery in Discovery novels. And now we're getting that. So, I mean, this is the first time I'm seeing this right now. So. Uh, yeah, what I'm seeing here looks really exciting. I like it. That's a Stamets novel, and it's about the Discovery. Which, you know, for a series that's called Star Trek Discovery, the novels, we've only gotten just little bits of the ship, I think, in The Way to the Stars. And uh, this is the first time that we're actually, you know, on the ship for a good period of time, it looks like. So that's kind of cool. It is. Yeah. Do we know what it's all about? Well, we do have a back cover blurb, which I will attempt to read here, even though it contains the word mycelial a number of times, and I love stumbling over this, so let's give it a try. The USS Discovery's specialty is using its spore-based hub drive to jump great distances faster than any warp-faring vessel in Starfleet. To do this, Lieutenant Paul Stamets navigates the ship through the recently revealed Mycelial Network, a subspace domain Discovery can briefly transit, but in which it cannot remain. 
After responding to a startling distress call originating from within the network, the Discovery crew find themselves trapped in an inescapable realm where they will surely perish unless their missing mycelial fuel is found or restored. Is the seemingly human man found alone and alive inside the network of the Starfleet officer he claims to be, or an imposter created by alien intruders who hope to extract themselves from the mycelial plane at the expense of all lives aboard Discovery? Well, now this is great. I love this. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. Let's read this now. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited for this. I, I like Paul Stamets. I like the whole weirdness of the mycelial network and all that. So definitely excited to read this one and see what Dave's come up with for it. Yeah, December seventeenth. You, I'm ready for you. This is uh, my holiday gift. <laughs> Excellent. So no cover yet. We don't know what the cover looks like, but as soon as uh, that comes, we will bring that to you in this audio only format where we will describe it and give it our seal of approval. Uh, so another bit of news. Um, so we've been expecting the imminent release of the autobiography of Mr. Spock by uh, David Goodman. And that was originally supposed to come out next month. However, it has been pushed back to 2020 now. Uh, we stumbled across this news on Amazon. It looks like the release date had changed. And Bruce actually reached out to Titan Books on Twitter just to get some confirmation. And it turns out that it is being uh, pushed till May of 2020 next year. So uh, that's unfortunate. We were looking forward to reading this, but uh, it looks like it's been delayed a bit. So if you've been expecting to get that one soon, uh, a bit of disappointment for you. You'll have to wait a little bit longer. Yeah, now this has been pushed before. So uh, it wasn't supposed to come out uh, last year and or and yeah. now this year and whatever. I'm assuming that the author, David Goodman, is busy with the Orville. That's my guess. I, I remember when it was first pushed back, uh, it was originally supposed to come out in 2018 and then it was pushed to this year. And my speculation then was that it had something to do with uh, some of the stuff we learn about Spock in season two of Discovery and maybe wanting to incorporate that. Yes. But uh, this newest one, I'm assuming, like you say, it probably has to do with other um, commitments that the author has. So. That's uh, it's too bad. We have to wait a little longer for it, but I'm sure it'll be great. Well, yeah, we and maybe it. he hadn't had time to fit in aspects of season two of Discovery, and we know we're getting a short tracks with Sp Spock, so maybe, maybe that also has to do with it. That's true. That's a good point as well. It might be might be related to that as well. Good call. Yeah, because it's <laughs> like you know, hey, I'm going to write an autobiography of Mr. Spock. Oh wait there's more added to canon that I don't know yet. <laughs> mm -hmm, exactly. <laughs> so it's a, it's a tall order for, for the author there. So, uh, you know, maybe just needs a little bit more time to work it all out. Uh, not sure why the delay exactly, but definitely looking forward to it either way. He needs to shift his focus to the autobiography of Janeway or Cisco or Archer or somebody <laughs> like that. There you go. <laughs> Coming later this year, the autobiography of Grand Nagus Zek. Ooh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know what? I would read that, though. Oh, I would, like, too. I would, I would absolutely read that. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that we can read, and this is coming out in October, uh, we have an announcement from IDW. They're putting out a Voyager Mirror Universe comic. So, you know, over the past few years, we've gotten stories having to do with the Mirror Universe TNG crew, and they've been involved in a couple of different story arcs. And they're kind of expanding that out into different series now. So uh, in October, we get a one-shot comic called Mirrors and Smoke. And Mirrors and Smoke introduces Captain Janeway of the Voyager, a rebel ship stranded in the Delta Quadrant, far from the ruins of the Terran Empire. When Janeway crowns herself Pirate Queen of the Quadrant, the locals, including scavengers Neelix and Kess, won't give up without a fight. Amid this conflict, the crew of the Voyager has a second problem on their hands. Just who is the Terran calling herself Annika Hansen? And can she be trusted? So uh, this looks really interesting. It's a one-shot comic, but it will be the first of a multi-month series of Star Trek Mirror Universe storytelling, with each release set to focus on a different crew from the Star Trek franchise. So the story is a standalone one-shot, but they'll be taking this concept with different crews as well going forward. I don't know. What do you think of this one, Bruce? 
I'm really interested in it because we haven't seen much of the Mirror Universe with the Voyager crew. And, I mean, the cover looks great. Um, I guess I'm just kind of wondering why the comics are doing so much with the Mirror Universe in the past year or so. I, I don't know. I hope it kind of connects in some way to what we saw with the Mirror Universe and Discovery or something. I don't know. I just think it's mm-hmm. interesting. I guess the Mirror Universe is selling well. I, I think that must be it. Yeah, there must be some interest in that and uh, some, you know, good numbers coming from it. Uh, so so this issue, Mirrors and Smoke, it's going to be written by Paul Allor and featuring artwork by one of my favorite artists, J.K. Woodward, who has done the cover as well. There's also going to be a retailer incentive cover by another artist, George Kultsudas. Um, looking at this cover, it's it's got the Voyager crew uh, in their mirror universe counterparts. And I see there's the mirror universe Tuvok there. Now I'm wondering if they remembered that the mirror universe Tuvok showed up in an episode of deep space nine. Oh, in that's the third right. Season through yes. the looking glass. Yes. I wonder if they've remembered that. And, and, uh, <laughs> cause I foresee a, a possible continuity issue here. Uh, maybe, but you know, there could be multiple mirror universes. There we go. Yeah, that's uh, easily explained in the multi multiverse theory of Star Trek. That, okay, my mind is set at ease. That's now. how I always approach things. It makes your life <laughs> so much easier. Excellent. Well, speaking of comics, uh, we do have a comic to review, like I said, and this one is an exciting one. It's issue number six of the Q Conflict. So the final issue of this six issue series the Q conflict in which uh, our various crews are pitted against one another um, to fight kind of a proxy war between the Q and other um, omnipotent like beings. So here we go. This is the final issue. And uh, first of all, I'm going to ask just kind of your initial thoughts on this one, Bruce. What did you think of this? Oh, wow. You put me on the spot. Um, <laughs> Gosh, I don't know. I I don't know. I like this one, but maybe not as much as the previous two. I remember really liking, I think, I can't remember, maybe it was the fourth one. I can't remember. It was one of those that were like really like one of my favorites. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is I liked it, but I thought it kind of ended a little weird. I am going to absolutely agree with that for you with you um, because yeah, there are a number of things in this issue that I liked Uh, the ending maybe wasn't one of them, (laughs) but let's get into it a little bit. So at at the end of the last one, we had gotten uh, Wesley Crusher and the traveler and Amanda Rogers all kind of showed up because, you know, things were getting out of hand with Q they figured. And they, they're kind of meeting with uh, the captains of the various crews and they're plotting to kind of make their move against Q at some point when they feel that, you know, this is kind of getting too far and too out of hand. And that happens fairly quickly because Q gives them their next task, which is to produce or capture an Omega molecule, which of course, as we know, is one of the most dangerous molecules in the entire universe and can destroy subspace and that sort of thing. So these crews kind of decide that they're not going to take it anymore and they're going to face off against Q. And how do you face off against an omnipotent enemy? That's uh, it's definitely a question there. Yeah, you bring in Amanda Rogers. <laughs> exactly. You bring your own uh, omnipotent being who furnishes everyone with weapons, Q weapons that can uh, hurt or immobilize or kill the Q. And uh, we've seen this before. We saw that in the Voyager episode, the Q and the Grey, where they were all uh, looked like um, Confederate soldiers versus uh, Union soldiers. And it was kind of the Civil War thing. And they all had these uh, rifles, but of course they were representative of these other weapons that are really powerful and can kill Q. And we see everyone outfitted with these weapons here and they all, you know, have different forms. Most of them have some kind of phaser, but I notice a few people have like Tommy guns and, and I think Tom Paris has an AK 47 (laughs) and Quark has like a musket or something like, 
I, I don't really understand why these people have the weapons they do. Well, because it's ones that they would it, they envision, right? I mean, is it I like so? Like what they just envision some kind of weapon, and maybe the weapon that you see Quark has is something on Ferenginar. So, I mean, I don't know. That could be. Um, Julian's got a pretty uh, pretty impressive looking sniper rifle there. <laughs> I don't even remember that. That well, I kind of remember that episode of Voyager, but I, honestly, I don't think I've seen that episode since the original airing. Because I haven't oh, done wow, a full yeah. Voyager rewatch. I mean, I watched it when it came out each uh, episode back when the series was new, and I just kind of pick and choose episodes. I haven't watched that in forever. I have to go back and <laughs> it, watch it. It's definitely been a long time for me too. Uh, I have done a few rewatches of Voyager over the years, but it's it's been a while for sure. Um, so we see, and, and I was honestly, I read this comic earlier and I had to go back over it again because I couldn't remember what Wesley and the traveler really ended up doing, like what they contributed. And we see it here. Uh, and it came back to me They They're the ones that kind of use the Iconian gateway to open a portal, uh, that takes everybody to where the Q and, and the other omnipotent beings are, which, uh, you know, I guess is what they get to do in this comic, because <laughs> I don't really remember much more other than, uh, you know, kind of a nice reunion between um, Beverly and Wesley, which was kind of nice as well. Yeah, I always like seeing uh, Beverly unite with, with Wesley. I feel like I've read some novels and comics lately that that's happened quite often, but she's always happy to see him. She's like my mom. She can never get enough of me. <laughs> oh, that's sweet. Well, so yeah, they, they go to this kind of garden where the omnipotent beings are all are gathered and Q realizes what's going on and, and sends these kind of monstrous plant things after, uh, the, oh, and I guess they're the chess pieces as well. The, the topiary that are shaped like chess pieces come alive and chase after our heroes. And then we get this moment here where I, I kind of forgot Quark was a part of all of this because has he had anything to do in any of the issues up till now? I don't recall. I don't recall either, but if he did, it's something pretty minor. Yeah. So it feels like they kind of said, Oh, we need Quark to do something. So he shoots a few of these plant things uh, to start with. And that's kind of the Quark moment, which is <laughs> odd. <laughs> the Quark <laughs> moment. <laughs> That's our quark moment for this issue. It's very quirky. <laughs> so we get this uh, extended kind of battle between um, our heroes and these chess pieces made out of topiary. And it involves them shooting them and burning them down and getting closer to Q. And Q starts putting different obstacles in their path. Uh, but the Metron and Aelborn, the Organian are kind of like, they're piecing out. They don't really want to have anything more to do with this, but Trelane decides to, uh, team up with Q and Q creates those animal thing soldiers from Hyden Q. And there's a big, huge battle and there's Magatus and there's even, I think like the parasites from conspiracy yeah. and some Jem'Hadar maybe. I'm not sure what those are. Yeah, there's and a whole variety. Brain. Yeah, Breen. Yeah. <laughs> Which I kind of thought it's, was cool. It's a little, you know, like the next panel, it's like, oh, what's next? Oh, there's those and there's these, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but the Starfleet crew managed to hold their own. They, they keep fighting all these things off. And Julian Bashir with that, uh, sniper rifle that I mentioned lines up a shot on Q and doesn't kill him, but, kind of grazes him and and uh causes him to be injured oh i didn't notice the telosians i'm just noticing that he was gonna like summon the telosians in there i thought that was an interesting choice though why the telosians yeah i i have to admit i didn't notice that the first time reading it through here but yeah he's just about to bring the telosians in and i'm wondering if they were going to create some sort of mass illusion or something like that but the other Q, the Q that we first meet in the episode Deja Q, played by Corbin Burnson, kind of steps in and says, no, 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 you got to stop this. And it all ends in this kind of uh, peace treaty. I mean, the battle was fine because of all the different uh, 
you know, alien races that came through that we recognize more so from the original series than some of the others. But I, I mean, I like that. I like Trelane and, and Q teaming up because I still think of Trelane as, you know, being part of the Q, but I think at this point he doesn't realize he's part of the Q. And, um, it seems like a abrupt way to end with one Q telling the other Q to just stop. Yeah, <laughs> but I I like then that they're having like a they're that they're having like a summit or something a meeting to decide you know what to do and and Q's in a suit and it was it's just a little strange that I mean I like that they had the discussion about uh, ending things and they're negotiating and that Julian Bashir is just kind of the hero because he knows not to shoot Q and to kill him because that would only make things worse. Does that make sense? I I think that that part kind of made sense to me. I was like, okay, you know, I, I it seems weird that he was ordered to d- do whatever it took kind of thing and that he was the one that kind of had to make the decision. I would think that like, you know, maybe he wouldn't be ordered to kill Q, but I I don't know. It was uh, a different choice, yeah. but I kind of go along with it here. But the part that really bothers me is Amanda and Wesley their yes. decision that they're going to give up all their powers and just li- live a normal human life. I agree completely. I don't know why this was put in here. I'm assuming as far as Wesley goes, because we see him in a Starfleet uniform in Nemesis that they wanted to tie that in somehow. But that really bugged me that like Wesley's no longer a traveler, doesn't have powers and Oh, he's just going to be back in Starfleet now. Like nothing happened kind of thing that, yeah, that bugged me. I didn't like that because I, I kind of, I know people disagree with this, but I kind of like the way the Wesley character went because, you know, the traveler at the very start of the series said, you know, Wesley Crusher is like Mozart. You know, he, he's a one of a kind mind that only comes along, you know, blah, 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 once every, however many generations and he needs to be nurtured and that sort of thing. And, you know, I know Starfleet officers are awesome and they're the best of the best, but I, it's, I don't see him as just another Starfleet officer. You know, it was kind of always cool that he had this different outcome. And just like, yeah, we just undid that. Yeah, no, I agree. That's one thing I really love about the Wesley Crusher is what you just said, him being a traveler. But, you know, I I, I don't I didn't mind that part because I thought, ooh, I'm, I want to see what happens next with this. And then I got to the end. I was like, oh, we're leaving it that way. <laughs> like, mm-hmm, I thought exactly. maybe they were deceiving Q and they weren't really giving up their powers. They, you know somehow we're cheating the process or something. Uh, Mm -hmm. I mean, if there was like another story, another issue that dealt with it, I mean, actually that would be something I'd be interested in reading. Okay. What happens with Wesley once he gives up his powers, does he accept normal life? And the same with Amanda too, Mm -hmm. you know, but we're not going to probably get that one's probably not going to come. It doesn't seem like it. No, I think this is, uh, this seems to be the end of this particular storyline. Which, uh, yeah, like you say, is a little unfortunate. It just, the, the ending just kind of fizzled a little bit for me, both in what happens overall with the whole situation. And then, like you said, with those characters in particular. So I guess with that in mind, how do we feel about the Q conflict series overall? What are your kind of final thoughts on that? Um, I would just say that I thought it was okay. You know, it, it, it's a little hokey, (laughs) you know, I mean, it just, as I mentioned in the first issue when we were reviewing that, it almost feels like a fan fiction thing to me. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is, hey, let's let's gather up the four crews. How can we have them all on an adventure together? Oh, we'll have Q bring them and, and we'll have them like intermix the crews together. And then, you know, they're all going to kind of compete against each other and then you know, then we'll bring Amanda Rogers in to kind of, and Wesley to kind of stop Q and then they'll give up their powers and everything's back to normal again. Like Mm -hmm. it just, it's, it's fun. There was times I enjoyed seeing the crews intermingled and working together, but um, I don't know. Just, (laughs) uh, yeah, this is just okay for me. Yeah. I'm kind of right there with you. Uh, It was fine, but 
you know, nothing really groundbreaking. It feels like, you know, they had this, like you said, like they had this idea, like, oh, let's get all these crews together and have them do a big thing. But without kind of a lot of meat on top of that, it was just like, let's find a way to make this really cool idea happen. And then without something really grandiose or big to say with it, which, you know, they kind of do, there is kind of like this, uh, bit of a moral, not moral, but lesson at the end, um, where Q talks a little bit about the nature of omnipotence and, and maybe that's a lesson Picard could learn kind of thing, but it, it feels not like the biggest idea to have tied this whole series around it. It needed a better, uh, more well thought out course to take and conclusion to have, if that makes sense. Yeah. It wasn't the kind of thing where I was really anticipating what the, ne- what's going to happen in the next issue, mm-hmm. you know, cause it's just like, we're just going along with them, you know, competing with each other. And then we get to the last issue to find out how all this wraps up, you know, it just didn't feel like there was much of a story to it. Yeah, definitely agreed. It was, it was certainly fun. There were some fun moments and I did enjoy reading it. But I don't think this is one that I will necessarily, you know, buy the trade paperback and and keep on my shelf and and be something that I would revisit uh, again in the future. Yep. Same thing. But uh, I have no regrets reading it, though. (laughs) No regrets. Absolutely. (laughs) Well, before we get to our feature, uh, we want to pop over into the Babel Conference and look at some feedback From Literary Treks 274, An Old Man in the Park Feeding Pigeons. And that was all about the the original series novel, The Children of Kings by David Stern. That was the latest Christopher Pike novel that we've read. So uh, let's pop over to the Babel Conference now and see what you had to say. So one of the things we talked about in that episode are the Star Trek ebooks that are on special each month. And Oz Trekkie mentions that many of the Star Trek novels Facebook groups have posts that show which ebooks are on special for each month. Literally Star Trek, which is one of the groups that Justin Ozer talks about when he's on the show. Uh, Oz Trekkie says that's the best group for listing the specials each month. And you can subscribe to Simon and Schuster to get the details to get the deals emailed directly to you. So thank you so much for that. That's awesome. Uh, And then going into the novel, he says, I just finished this novel this week for the first time due to the cover. I just pictured everything in the prime universe as I didn't read the author's notes. I loved Boyce's arc in this novel. He shows the same determination as McCoy in treating the patient in front of him, regardless of who they are or what they have done. The conspiracy theory that was built up and the characters not knowing who to trust kept me guessing until all was revealed, but I was expecting a larger, more far-reaching conspiracy other than a couple of rogue Starfleet intelligence personnel thinking they knew what was best for the Quadrant. I also kept waiting for Captain Vlasidovich to be part of the conspiracy. I didn't picture the conspirators as Section 31 agents, just inept intelligence types. I think that's a really good oxymoron. (laughs) The continuity errors don't worry me as much as some. I enjoyed reading what was, for me, a previously unread Star Trek novel. For me, I give this one four stars. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for uh, your thoughts on that. I agree. The one thing that I was thinking was I didn't think the intelligence officers were rogue. I think they were working for Starfleet Intelligence, which made me really question their motives even more. But that's a good point. They might have been rogue and kind of doing this on their own as well you know you could say that they were section they were in starfleet intelligence but secretly were working for section 31 or they went rogue or whatever so yeah that's interesting so justin Ozer says i really enjoyed year five number three i thought about it only being three years for all of those changes but it didn't bother me much i figured there was a lot they could do if they had everyone on the planet on board with it and working like mad towards their goals. And in my head canon, the communicator has a copy of space Wikipedia on it with tons of info. Anyway, I realize it still stretches things, but I set it aside and had a good time with the comic and I'm looking forward to the next issue. Yeah, Justin, I, yeah, I agree. I'm thinking, well, you know, it's a, you know, communicator small, but as we know from carrying our iPhones and, androids that you know a lot of information can sit on a small device so yeah there probably is something like a wikipedia in the communicator 
it's maybe like the Star Trek version of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Maybe it just says Earth is mostly harmless. No, wait, it had a lot more information on Earth. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ian Kimmons says, not my favorite Pike novel. I finished it, but it was a hard slog. I'm really enjoying the year five comic. Only just finished IDW's year four, which was great as well. Uh, thanks for that. I actually haven't read year four that was covered before I was uh, on the show. So um, I that might be one that would be fun to kind of go back and take a look at some point. Yeah, I think I read a couple issues, but I haven't read the whole series. And then we had Brian Cavici say, I have this novel, but I haven't read it yet. Well, Brian, read the freaking novel because it's good. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe you've read it by now. Yeah, maybe you have. I, uh, I, I initially didn't think it was good when I first read it, but then I thought it was really good this last time I read it. So, you know, maybe read it twice just for good measure. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you guys all so much for your feedback. We really appreciate it. But I think it's time that we jump over into the feature and welcome a couple of special guests to the show. As we mentioned at the top of the show, uh, we're doing something a little different for this episode. We want to talk a little bit about how to write Star Trek novels and what it takes to kind of get a Star Trek novel published uh, these days. So in order to do that, we figured we should get a couple of experts. So joining us. Well, thank you, Dan, couple... for introducing me as an expert on this topic. I really <laughs> appreciate that. I'm sure you're an expert at something, Bruce. We haven't figured it out yet, but. <laughs> yeah, I haven't either. I'm sorry. Go on. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, so yeah, we did invite a couple of other experts, a pair of veteran Star Trek writers. So we have David R. George III and Dayton Ward joining us. So gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. So you've called us gentlemen and experts in the same sentence. Mm. I'm not sure who you're talking to, but hi, it's great to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming on, David. You missed the part. He called you veterans also. Well, we are veterans. I'll give you that. And Dayton, twofold, is a veteran. But um, yes, we are certainly veteran Star Trek writers, if not experts or gentlemen. <laughs> a veteran of the Star Trek canon wars. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Blue Oyster Cold. I had to do it. Excellent. Uh, well, definitely, I, I would say veteran definitely applies to you guys. Between the two of you, uh, I don't want to venture a guess as to how many novels you've written. I know, Dayton, I just reviewed the 23rd novel of yours on my uh, website. So it, the numbers are up there for sure. Wow, 23. That's impressive, Dayton. Thank you. That's what she said. No. Um, <laughs> I honestly, I was trying to do a count in my head right quick because that was, you know, that's like homework I could have done prior to the show and would have come in armed with information. But I've lost count of the number of books you've written, David. I know you've been doing it even longer than I have, but a longer, well, yeah, but, but, but fewer, fewer novels. I think I'm pretty sure I'm at 18. So okay. you've lapped me, but you were doing it a couple, at least a few years before I came up through the ranks, so to speak. I think your first, no was your first novel 34th rule? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 99. I that was public. Okay. Well then you were at least three years ahead of me. I was still in the strange new world's realm at that point. I got to, I did the 34th rule and then I had a little bit of a hiatus as, as they were playing musical editors um, at that time. And, and then came back with, what was my second one? Was it twilight? I guess. I don't know. It, it, it's so long ago now, but I don't know. But 23, I, you could have said the 35th 20, rule. Nobody would know. The 30, yeah. <laughs> right. The long awaited sequel to the 34th rule, the, 34.5 rule. <laughs> Perfect. Well, between the two of you, it's uh, up over 40 novels at least. So I'm very happy to have your expertise on the show to talk about this. So I guess just to start out, um, kind of for aspiring writers out there, uh, what is the best way to just start writing? And, and how did you guys get your start in writing professionally? Uh, Dayton, why don't you go first? Well, we know my secret origin story. Um, I started writing uh, just as a creative outlet back in the 90s and then sold stories to the first three Strange New Worlds contests, uh, at which point John Ordover, who was the editor at that point, invited me to write a Star Trek novel. So being someone who had never written a novel or anything longer than a short story, I, of course, I said, sure, that sounds like a great yeah. idea. What could possibly <laughs> go wrong? Um, and then, of course, while I was writing that, the SCE 
series of novellas started up and we were drawn into that world. And um, after that, I think we, we didn't actually make our way up to the starting lineup, as I like to call it, until like early 2000s uh, with the Time 2 series. That's when we kind of got called up from the minors, so to speak. But no, let's let's back up just a little bit here because you said, oh, you know, I was just kind of writing for fun or whatever. I mean, did you, what was writing your uh, major or focus of study in school or, you know, how did, is it just practicing? Like, how, what, why, why were you even writing? I like to read a lot and I like to read a lot of Star Trek fiction and I decided to take a shot at writing a Star Trek story and I wrote one and it was horrible and no one has ever read it or if they have read it, they no longer live because I'd got rid of all the survivors (laughs) and I burned all the copies because it's that bad. Um, No, I just did it for fun. It was just like I said, I was a software developer. I never went to I never went to school for writing or took any kind of writing courses. It was just something I started doing for the goof of it. Not to disrespect the process, it was just a creative outlet. And we would start with little silly stories, and then it would start with, you know, Star Trek stories and other stories, and then stories with my friends and I doing crazy things, you know, you know, idealized versions of ourselves. So of course we all have six pack abs, and and we have superpowers <laughs> and stuff like that. But I mean, it was just a way to just have a little fun. And then the Strange New Worlds contest came along, and I'd been writing, I'd written a few Star Trek stories that other people had read and liked enough to kind of not pressure me but suggest that i enter the first contest so that's when and we all know what happened after that so pocket lost its mind and hired me uh and that's what i've been doing fairly ever since i mean i it, for the longest time it was a part-time thing writing uh i worked full-time as a software developer and then uh just a few years ago i decided to write full-time as a freelancer and that's where we are now and that first story that was uh the aliens are coming is that right my first short story for Strange New Worlds was called Reflections. It was a TOS tale. Oh, right. Excellent. And uh, so, David, how about yourself? How did you get started kind of in the professional writing arena? Uh, in the professional writing arena, um, well, I was actually living in San Francisco at the time um, that I decided – I wanted to be a writer probably since I was five years old, but I never wanted to be a starving artist. So I didn't study, I didn't go to school and be a a writing major or anything like that. I majored in mathematics and scientific computing. I did have a minor in writing, Um, but I I, I just, I I don't want to be a starving artist. So I I was going to make sure I was employable. But in, in, um, in the, the mid nineties, I was living in San Francisco and I decided to try my hand at writing, and I wrote a, a, a few scripts, and I actually ended up having a few agents, a few television scripts, um, and I uh, I got some agents, all of whom apparently were very bad at their jobs, uh, and, and whom I grew to loathe over time. I actually had like a, a Cheers script and a uh, maybe it wasn't Cheers, The Wonder Years, a Next Generation Star Trek: The Next Generation script. Um, I had a few scripts and, the, and they were all, they eventually got shopped, um, to shows that within, within weeks of me shopping, uh, my agent shopping the scripts to these series, the series got canceled. <laughs> I hope I bear no responsibility for that cancellation, but, um, they showed, oh, I wrote a quantum leap script. Quantum leap would not look at quantum leap scripts though, because they were fearful of being sued. Because if you wrote a quantum leap script where Sam leaped into a nun, and then you told a story, um, and they and they turned it down, and then they did a, a show where Sam leaped into a nun and did a completely different story, they were still concerned that you would sue them, um, even though they didn't steal the story. Uh, you know, at the at the at the worst, they could have been accused of uh, taking an idea, but they were just concerned that that was going to just draw lawsuits. But my agent ended up sending my Quantum Leap script to MacGyver, a show I had never seen. And MacGyver wanted to buy, uh, wanted me, wanted me to write a, 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 an episode for them. And within days of me finding that out, MacGyver was canceled. <laughs> <laughs> so I never got to do that. So then I ended up um, pitching uh, with a writing partner, pitching some stories to Voyager. And that was my first professional sale. We sold the first season Voyager episode called Prime Factors. It was depending on how you count the ninth or tenth episode of the first season. And in fact, we pitched the episode based on the show's Bible. We'd never seen a single moment of it because at the time we pitched, they were still filming the pilot. 
caretaker. So um, that that was my fir- first professional sale. So going to the world of Star Trek novels in particular, I would I'm curious as to kind of just like an outline of what the process a Star Trek novel goes through, uh, kind of from conception to publication. Well, I think Dayton and I can probably both speak to this. I think when, well, it, it, it's probably different the first novel out of the shoot because you're you're selling a Star Trek novel for the first time. But subsequent to that first time where you break through, um, it can be uh, there can be different ways in which you, you end up writing a Star Trek novel. A lot of times. Uh, you'll say to your editor, hey, I want to write a st- at, at Simon & Schuster at Pocketbooks, I want to write a Star Trek novel, and they'll say, fine, we've got a we've got a Next Generation slot open, we've got a Voyager slot open, we've got an original series slot open, or or they'll come to you. And in fact, I, I think most of the time they've come to me um, in, in the course of my writing novels and say, hey, we want, you know, want another Deep Space Nine book. Sometimes they will give you some elements that they like. When I wrote Rough Beasts of Empire, the elements I was given, the elements I, uh, I was given were: you need Spock in this novel, you need Cisco in this novel, and you need to get Cisco back into Starfleet because at the time he had just come back from the Celestial Temple. Spoiler alert! <laughs> and um, he was not yet back in Starfleet; he was just living on Bajor. So we'll get story. We'll get sometimes elements like that that, that they'll they'll ask us to include. Typically, they won't give us entire stories, or at least that's been the case through, through most of, uh, through all of my writing career, except in the case where, where you're working on a, um, a multiple author, multiple book series, and then you'll all get together with the, the writers and the editor and try and beat out the story, the overall story for the three or four book series, whatever it's going to be. But then you'll all, be, each each individual writer or writing team will get out on their own and figure out what they're going to do. I, I assume it's similar for you, Dayton. Yeah, it's pretty much. Um, like you said, sometimes you go to the editor with an idea. Sometimes the editor calls you. I mean, again, like David said, once you're part of the rotation or the, or the stable or whatever you want to call it, you know, as often as not, the editor will say, hey, I've got a slot for a TOS novel in 20 whatever uh, you feel like, or is that something you want to do? And you either say yes or no. And I usually say yes. Cause TOS and me are like this. Um, and then the other times, like for, for we've worked, David and I have worked on a couple of multiple author efforts before. So what he describes is true. We get on call and we hammer out the big beats of the overarching storyline and then figure out where each book might intersect, you know, what will it play with within that, arc and then we all go to our separate corners and come up with a story that feeds into that larger storyline hmm. and then uh, some poor bastard with the last book in the series usually ends up having to tie up all those loose ends can't imagine that job <laughs> yeah. at all twice in a yeah. row <laughs> so um no that's a lot of fun though i mean i enjoy the collaboration that comes with those types of projects because you get you know a lot of folks on the phone and everybody's into it they're passionate about the project and they want to do right by it and you bounce ideas off each other and there's a lot of yes and and a lot of give and take and um, it ends up being my favorite part of the whole process a lot of times. Yeah, that collaboration is a lot of fun. The editor, and right now it's Margaret Clark and has been for a while, typically, you know, they oversee the project and, and she'll have a lot of ideas and throw things out there. And she'll keep, she'll keep everybody on the beam as far as continuity goes to, intercontinuity uh, between the books and also with the shows and films. Um, but also the writers are pretty devoted to that as well i've i've plenty of times i've gotten emails not even when i not not even when i'm writing the same in the same series as somebody else but or in the, in the same uh, you know book series um but somebody will write a writer will send me an email to hey did you use Bashir here and and what exactly did he do or 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 whatever so because it's going to feed into some book they're writing down the line and they just need to know that. And I've certainly sent out some of those emails myself, knowing that somebody's written something that's going to have an impact on what I'm about to write. And uh, everybody's always very, very uh, 
gracious uh, and generous with their their time and effort in, in getting you those details. These days, the editor, in this case, it's Margaret Clark, as far as the the person on the in the trenches or on the front line helping the authors directly. It's she's very much like the head writer in a writer's room or a showrunner in a writer's room on a television show. Um, she she keeps track of what everybody's doing. She keeps all the plates spinning. She makes sure that there's any intersections between books that the, any potential conflicts are addressed and fixed if as appropriate. And, you know, it's just uh, I wouldn't want that. Well, that job would be fun, but they'd have to pay me a lot of money for it. <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it's like herding cats. I mean, because we are all, you know, we're all writers and we all have our little egos and we all have to be tended to and nurtured and fed and all that kind of stuff. Um, and she's very good at handling Various disparate personalities. <laughs> uh, wow, that's a very generous way of putting that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, we are all we all have our quirks and our kinks and our little problems <laughs> that she has to tend to. So she's a good mama, mama duck, I guess. In that yeah. regard, well, you've been talking about the the continuity and and working with other off- authors to keep things consistent, keeping that continuity going. Is someone at Simon Schuster or maybe it's Margaret keeping like a database of all this information, or are you just strictly relying on talking to the other authors or looking at memory beta? I didn't know if there's some kind of master sheet or database where every th- every character is being tracked and what book it's in and and so on and so forth. No, there's nothing like that. Well, yeah. I, I know that uh, I know Marco Palmieri, uh, who w- was a an editor for a while uh, on the books. Um, he did keep not an overall uh, database of facts, but but he did keep some some lists and, and notes on things. But I think memory beta is probably better than anything else. Um, I mean, you're always best to go to the source material, but you can get an idea of what that source material is from from memory beta. Um, there are, I mean, there are a couple that? of minor lists. There's one list that I know we, that Margaret, well, I mean, because I was keeping it up for a while because I was writing, I think I wrote three or four next generation books in a row. And so we, we kept a roster of every, we kept a roster of all the characters on the Enterprise E, all the new crew members who had been introduced, even if they just were NPCs, you know, but referenced, we would we would keep them in this master list so that if somebody killed off somebody, you know, we could double check, Oh, you can't kill off that person or, you know, you can't use that person. They were killed off in the pre- you know, previous book or something like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so, you I mean, probably and, keep your own list too, I, Dayton. I, don't keep, you? I keep a master list, but I, but I can, there's a list of, as I remember, there was a list of everybody on enterprise Titan, Aventine and Robinson and deep space nine and Voyager. And, but, yeah. And I modified the hell out of the next gen one because I killed off a bunch of people <laughs> in a couple of books uh, yeah. or, in, or introduced some more, you know, or you introduced some new ones to replace people. So, yeah, I, that was the last time I saw that list. Yeah. Last time I saw that list was when I finished Available Light. And that was so that would have been back, you know, last late last year. Hmm. So but I think overall the all I would say most details are are. You know, in Margaret Clark's brain, brain and yeah. brain. What did brain? Yeah, she's pretty um, much the keeper of the of all that. Yeah, but but really, I think fans go crazy about canon. They go crazy about continuity. I think as fans ourselves, my Margaret's certainly a Star Trek fan. Dane and I are Star Trek fans. We don't want to get things wrong, so we we do our due diligence in trying to keep things straight. Also, it's it's sometimes not easy because. Um, not only do some of the books, particularly earlier books, uh, contradict each other, oftentimes they end up contradicting the show. So it's really hard to sort of keep all these details um, exactly right, but we, we do our best. Well, David, when you did the Crucible trilogy for the 40th anniversary, you were actually given permission not to uh, have to work in that novel continuity. Well, I, you know, when I sat down to write those books, I, I, I remember sitting down at my desk with a pad and a pen, and uh, and I was really excited about it because it was my first time writing in the TOS universe, uh, at least professionally. Um, I'd written some stuff, you know, when I, actually when I was a kid. Um, uh, but I, I sat down and I, and I I was really excited, and I I put my pen on the pad, and I thought, what in the hell do we not know about these characters that I'm going to write about? I thought this is crazy, and then I thought. Okay, there's what six at the time, six hundred and fifty Star Trek novels or whatever it was. Many of them, which were original series, I've read a lot of them, but not only do I not remember those, but I haven't read all of them. So how am I going to keep consistent? And again, knowing even those books weren't consistent with each other or with the show and films, 
how, what am I going to do? And, and I talked to Marco, Marco Palmieri was my editor at the time. And I, you know, what we do? And we decided, look, this is supposed to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the show. So all these books need to be is consistent with the show and the films. And that's it. And for the show, we also included the animated series. Um, and as much as we could, you know, any details that had been revealed in Next Generation or Deep Space Nine or, or Voyager. But, um, yeah, so it, it, I don't really like the notion that it's a separate continuity, but it is certainly of a continuity with Star Trek canon. Um, and because I know I, I'm, I'm kind of, I think I'm an outlier in this among the writers, but maybe not. I don't love um, sort of fan service. I don't, I don't like an overabundance of, of winking at the camera and, and, and putting in little in jokes that readers will get once in a while. It's fine. I don't like doing a lot of that, but because this was a series that was going to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the show, I really wanted to ground the stories in the show itself. And so I made a decision early on that I would, in as, in as unobtrusive a way as I could, I would actually make some reference to every single episode and every single, that includes the three seasons of the show, the animated, two seasons, of the animated series, uh, animated show, and the, the seven films that had uh, original series characters in it. So, um, but I wanted to do it in a way that was not really obvious and was not going to take the reader out of the story. That's uh that's really ambitious. I'm going to have to go back and read them now. <laughs> I, it's a challenge. We made a similar decision with the legacies trilogy for the 50th anniversary, uh, Greg Cox, Dave, Matt, Kevin, and Delmore and myself, we decided that we were going to follow David's model that he used on crucible, not the references to all the shows, but the idea that you didn't have to be steeped in novel continuity to read these books because we were thinking people are dialing into Star Trek's 50th anniversary. They'll find something with the 50th anniversary logo on it and they want to read. And so we did the same thing. We, we made sure we were consistent with the shows, but we didn't, I, didn't, I wouldn't say we discounted the novel continuity. We just made sure not to make any overt references to anything from the novels. Right. Hmm. So that was sort of a, which was actually harder than it sounds because you always kind of want to like slide in a favorite entry, you know, reference to your favorite novel. And we're like, no, nah, we're not going to do that this time. We're going to, we're going to play it straight with the shows and, and be this more approachable for the casual consumer who's just hopping on board for the 50th anniversary. Well, and that, that's true. You never, that's sort of true whenever you're writing a Star Trek novel is you don't, and it's sometimes it's unavoidable, but you really don't want to make, a first time reader throw up their hands and discuss and have no idea what's yeah. going on. Yeah. We've talked about this one on the show before. Um, you know, I, I try to approach it. I try to rewrite every Star Trek novel as though someone will be reading that story and it's their first ever Star Trek novel. So, um, if I have to choose between the longtime fan who reads every book every month or whatever, and the new person who's just coming on board and is tentative and taking their first little timid steps, I'm going to try to favor that person. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, if I, I, I hate to choose, but I got to go with the person who's, you know, just getting involved for the first time. I don't want them to throw the book across the room because they don't understand. Well, that can be problematic. 15 novels worth of continuity. Yeah, it's tough. It's a, it's a hard line to walk. You have to be very careful. You don't want to discard the longtime fan, but you don't want to make it too complicated for the new reader who's just trying to get on the ramp, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's a tough, yeah. it's a tough line to walk. I don't know that I always succeed, but that's my intention. You know? Well, I know that there's certainly plenty of readers uh, out there who, who believe that I haven't always succeeded at that because um, I'm like you, I always write my novel as if somebody's going to read it for the first Star Trek for the first time. And so I, but when you, when you trying to get details out there that a reader needs to know if they're reading for the first time, that can be a problem for the reader who's steeped mm -hmm. in Star Trek. Right, I know this saying. already. Why are you telling me? Right. But, you know, again, I, know. Yeah, I try to favor that new person as much. You yeah, know, I, it's tough. I'm with you. I don't want to, I'm not being dismissive of the long-term reader. I'm just saying, understand that <laughs> we're writing these for a broad audience. It'd be, it, my life would be so much easier if we were only writing for the, you know, the, the hardcore people who just bought the books every month, <laughs> but oh, yeah, Simon absolutely. and Schuster prefer that we appeal to a broader audience. So you have to, you have to face certain realities. And it's weird too, when you're writing a Star Trek novel as, co as compared to an original novel, n not, no, not immediate tie-in effort, because if I'm writing, if I'm writing a novel and I introduce 
a, a scene on the bridge of a starship, if it's an original novel, I'm going to describe the bridge, mm-hmm. right? But if it's a Star Trek novel, you got to, first of all, you even you have to assume that even a first time reader has seen the show. Nobody's going to pick up a Star Trek novel. I wonder what the Star Trek thing is. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they've seen the show. <laughs> they've seen they, the bridge. Yeah. So, so you have to sort of step back from being a novelist at some point and be a Star Trek writer. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm just talking in terms of story accessibility. Yeah, I mean, right. we all We all know what the bridge looks like, and, and you know what Mr. Spock looks like. Everybody knows what he looks like, even if you've never watched a single episode of Star yeah, Trek. Yeah, you don't have to explain the – that he has pointed ears and you don't have yeah. to explain his heritage, you know, I mean, but, and you don't have to, you don't necessarily have to describe the bridge in glaring detail, but you know, it's, you do have to describe parts of it in relation to how the characters are moving about. So you can paint a picture of where they're, what they're doing and how, where they are. And well, so, yeah, but right, that's, that's, the, but that's, that's part of that balance. It's like, it's yes. I'm not going to describe every last button on the bridge, but at the same time, you know, you, you want to be able to communicate that they're not just standing in a, in a blank room. You, you have to, you have to provide a little bit of that, but, you know, that's what media tie-in kind of gets you into a way of thinking. I don't know if you've ever read much fan fiction. Um, and I, if I, if I have, it's been a, a long time ago, but every now and then I've actually had friends or friends of friends or parents of friends or who, who said, you know, who wanted me to read their Star Trek novel or their Star Trek story or whatever. And which is always uh, hard work. <laughs> it's such hard work. It's hard work because typically they're not writers, and you know that in the first sentence or the first paragraph, and then you have to critique it, and you have to be you, because they're friends or friends of friends or relatives of friends. You want to be gentle with them, and it's it's uh, it's hard to do to genuinely critique something. But as I what, very slowly I put you, my manuscript off to the side, <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I can't tell you how many times, though, uh, when you you read a, a, a fan fiction uh, writer, and th- the first thing they'll they'll say is, "It was a boring day on the Enterprise. Everybody was on the bridge, and they were they, they you know they were. It was a humdrum day. I mean, I, I can't. It, it's crazy how much fan fiction sort of starts that mm-hmm. way, um, and the notion of the crew starting out bored not only is sort of I mean, obvious, and and, and it's also boring. <laughs> if the characters are bored, the reader is going to be bored. It doesn't work that way. Well, and, the, and you mentioned fan fiction. So, I mean, in a sense, you guys started off writing fan fiction. You know, I mean, you weren't writing other things necessarily before you got into Star Trek. I mean, you know, David, you were writing some scripts for some shows and stuff. But now if somebody listening to this is writing fan fiction – Besides making it not boring, what other <laughs> advice would you give them in structuring a Star Trek story? Because how do you structure a interesting Star Trek story? Well, I mean, there are hundreds of hours of examples of what makes a good Star Trek story <laughs> on, yeah. on TV and yeah. Blu-ray and DVD. Um, as far as what makes a good Star Trek novel. And then hundreds well, more. In- I'll just say there's hundreds of those. I mean, the, 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 anybody who wants to read a, or write a Star Trek novel has a wealth of research material before them. And so the idea that somebody would want to write a Star Trek novel without ever having read a Star Trek novel, that is a red flag for me right there. Because that's telling me you're just looking for the quick, the quick reward you're not willing to put in the work. Um, writing is hard. Writing media tie-ins is a different flavor of hard. Yeah. People ask me all the time, which is harder, writing original fiction or writing media fiction? Yeah. And they're different. They're they're hard, but they're different for they're hard for different reasons. It is interesting that uh, I've met a lot of uh, Star Trek fans who purport to want to be writers, uh, and I'm sure that some of them do. But I think is I've come to the conclusion that some of them just want to be a part of Star Trek, and they they maybe think, well, I'm obviously not going to be on camera. Uh, and I don't know anything about directing or editing or costuming. I'll just, you know, but I, you know, I can sit up. Yeah, I, I, I can sit at my, uh, I keep my computer and write a book. That's, but it, like Dane said, it's hard work and it takes practice. And, um, you know, I wrote, I started writing when I was very young and it was basically just for myself. It wasn't anything that I was going to try and publish. And I, I do remember when I was probably 12 or 13 years old or something, I started writing a Star Trek novel, um, and I, I don't know how far I got, maybe maybe 50 pages or something, which, you know, for a 12-year-old is probably a lot, but um, 
you know, that that's not quite going to cut it. <laughs> you really need to, you need to sit down and you said, what makes a good start? How do you write a good Star Trek story? The first thing you have to do is, is come up with a good story. Forget about it being Star Trek because everything that's true about, about writing a novel and, and, and storytelling is true of writing a Star Trek novel. Um, you know, you, you have to have a beginning, a middle and an end. You have to have character arcs, uh, for, for all your characters, you, you need to, to go somewhere with the story. There have to be themes uh, upon which you build. I mean, if you're going to write a good Star Trek novel, you first have to write a good novel. And in fact, I always start that way. I always, when I'm going to write a Star Trek novel, I sit down and I think to myself, what exactly do I want to talk about? And I sort of start thematically that way. And then I, 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 I come to the story by degrees, you know, in concert with what I'm going to do with my characters and, and where they're going to end up. And the, one of the great things about Margaret and Marco before her is that we have a staggering amount of latitude when it comes to these characters. Um, I, I mean, we've killed off canon characters in the non-canon novels. Um, and we don't do that lightly. Um, but if there's a compelling story reason for it, we do it. Um, and, and we're allowed to do it. I mean, I blew up Deep Space Nine in a series called Deep Space Nine. That's pretty wide latitude. So um, I, my kudos to our editors for, for allowing us to be as creative as they do. So speaking of characters, actually, that, that kind of segues nicely into the next thing I wanted to talk a little bit about. And that's kind of how do you approach writing established characters uh, as opposed to original characters and that sort of thing? Well, I mean, I think the driving force behind that is, you know, they're not our characters. They are characters on loan to us uh, by benevolent powers that be. And even though they have given us far more latitude in recent years than we would have ever gotten when these shows were in production, you know, the shows on which the books are based. I mean, they still have certain lines we're not allowed to cross. We have, they have certain, sure. they have certain absolutes that we can't do, but that's, you know, it's an inversion of the way things probably were 25 or 30 years ago where the list of don'ts was very long and the list of do's was very strict and boring. And over the years that process has evolved where the list of don'ts is actually rather short and reasonable in my mind. Um, very reasonable. I um, think very, very yeah, reasonable. I mean, and, and usually when you propose an idea, instead of it being shot down out of hand because, well, we never saw that on a show, so, and that's the end of the thinking, you know, the, the people who, who oversee this stuff, both at Pocket and CBS, they, they basically give you a chance to make your case. And, that, and when I say that, they mean, you know, when you present your outline for what's going to be your story, you're, you're, you're proposing your ideas. And if they, they have a question about something, they'll take you to task for it in a gentle, professional manner. And they give you a chance to argue your side of that storyline. And, you know, as often as not, you can win them over. Uh, yeah, just, absolutely. It just depends on, the, on what we're talking about here. Like I said, there's only certain absolutes, we can, you know, certain lines that we can't cross. But I think, and, and if you heard, you know, they make sense. You can't, you can't, introduce uh elements to a character's personality that, that are not supported by the source material like i can't turn you know kirk and spock into lovers for example you know just as an extreme example um but otherwise you know just because it we never saw it on the show is never an excuse to not try something it used to be that used to be the that used to be the the you know the line of defense was well we never saw that on the show so we can't go with that well i never saw anybody take a piss on the show <laughs> but i'm going to go with the notion that they do that on occasion during the course of a day you know so that's that was the kind of thinking that used to rule over uh this type of stuff way back when before i got in the game and nowadays the the people at at CBS, the folks at CBS, the folks at Pocketbooks, they're very supportive when an author comes to them with an idea, even if it's a radical idea that might shake up the sandbox a little bit. We're very, very fortunate in that regard, I think. And I've had it, I've had it go both ways. Most of the time, for me, when I've had somebody say, you know, we can't do that, um, I actually am thinking of a time where I, I, I turned in an outline and Marco read it and he said, yeah, we, we you, the way you've ended this, we just, there's just, we can't do that. And I was like, all right. Well, let me give me a couple of days to to figure something else out. <laughs> and then two and then two days later, Marco called me back and said, "You know what? There actually is a compelling story reason to do this, and I see where we can go." And he and he let me do it. But at the same time, and, and most of the time, that's what what has happened, uh, at least with me, and I'm sure probably with plenty of other writers. As Dayton said, you make your case, and they are 
they, these are Star Trek fans, and these are really, really good editors. So they know what they're doing, and 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 they're very supportive. I have had I've had Margaret say to me in one of my more recent novels, I had something happen toward the end of a novel, something relatively gruesome, and Margaret said, "You can't do that," and I I, I have to do it in order to make this plot point work. Otherwise, without this gruesome thing happening, the motivation doesn't exist. It just, it fails. And she said, figure it out. <laughs> Two days later, I figured it out. And Margaret was absolutely right. It was, it was one of those lines we just, we shouldn't cross. And she was right. And I saw, I, I saw, she was right. She convinced me. So it goes both ways. It goes ways. both ways. Yeah. That, and that's the product of a long-term working relationship with these folks. We've been doing this a long time. And we know where the lines are. We know what we can't do. But we also know, hey, you know, we can try to shake something. I mean, we were talking about this a while, well, a short while back, guys, when we were talking about available light. I made a decision over the course of writing the manuscript to make a hard left turn <laughs> over the course of my story from what the outline said and do something with a character that uh, was not in the outline. And it was a canon character to boot. And nobody batted an eye at CBS or Pocket Books. We're talking about Admiral Ross. Um, I don't know if you've read the book, David. <laughs> I, I, I actually have not. Okay, well, it's okay. But, I mean, that's I'm not I'm not I'm not calling you out. I'm just saying, you know. No, no. Every no. once in a while, in fact, you know, every once in a while, I've been told, you know, you're very good about playing the toys and putting them back. Um, but I'm okay with you breaking the toys once in a while. Breaking a toy once in a while. That was the quote I got from from licensing. And I said, okay, well, I'll call that bluff and <laughs> try something. And lo and behold, they didn't bat an eye. It never even came up in a conversation. See, I, that's, that's the one thing I've often wondered, especially when I hear uh, Quentin Tarantino wanting to do a rated R version of Star Trek, which I would expect would kind of break m the mold of traditional Star Trek. Is there any time that you really wanted to just cross that line and say, you know, I, I almost want to make this oh, yeah. a horror. <laughs> but, but, and then what the reaction is, nope, these are the lines you have to stay in. I mean, well, I mean, it's like you start, to, sometimes I've gotten as far as writing a draft of something that, that goes way beyond what I would normally propose and what I would expect to be accepted. But I write it just to get, get it out of my system and go, yeah, that's, there's a reason why they have that rule <laughs> or yeah. something like that. But well, I mean, sometimes it, that's Sometimes it's not even rules, right? It's just, it's just sort common of, sense. Like, I really you, don't want to go that way. Yeah, you know, what's, you know what Star Trek is? I wrote a, a very involved it's scene it's once. It's Star Trek. Right. I wrote a very involved scene once that, that had, a, again, a gruesome bit in it. Uh, a, a Quentin Tarantino bit of violence, perhaps. Um, that when I finished writing it, I loved the scene. And then I went back and rewrote it and mm -hmm. took that bit of gruesomeness out just because it wasn't Star Trek. It just, it didn't fit the ethos of the show. And it's not because I wasn't, I mean, I guess I was sort of self-censoring, but it wasn't, I don't feel like it was censoring so much as editing because it. it yeah, I wouldn't call it censoring. Fit. I was just, yeah, I was conforming just, to what the show did. Yeah, yeah, I was conforming yeah, it to was, the show. And, and it, I think, I actually think, I mean, Tar Tarantino's, uh, a fascinating filmmaker, and I actually think there's a way to do an R-rated Star Trek that doesn't in that 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 stays within the ethos of Star Trek. I don't know that Quentin Tarantino would do that, but if he's a big enough fan, I think he might. I don't I don't know, but um, I'm willing to let him see. I'm willing to let him give it a shot and show us what he's got. I mean, I'm not going to rule it out of hand. Uh, yeah, no, or, of course or, not. Or, not. You know, denounce that of hand. I'm, I'm, I mean, I think Star Trek, and we've talked about this too. Star Trek as a framework for storytelling is rather robust, and it can handle yeah. a lot of things. I mean, there are certain lines, that, but the lines that we're talking about crossing, I think, and David, based on what David said, I kind of agree. It's like there's just certain. I don't need to go that many steps past the line. I can I can cross the line. And I say cross line, I, I can push the envelope. That might be a, a better description. I can push the envelope a little farther, but I don't need to push it that far to the extreme. I mean, it's just, and it's just, a, you know, if, if, there's, if there's a story supported reason to do it, I will take a shot at it. Mm -hmm. um, but even then, I, even as I'm writing and I know if it, whether or not it's a, does it really fit Star Trek? Does Star Trek do this? Just, you know, uh, and I end up downing myself back on, on certain things. I mean, it's not like I'm afraid to write it because I write it in other forms of fiction. I've gone way, way into the dark space with my own fiction. But, <laughs> yeah. um, so it's not like I'm af afraid to write it. I'm just like, that's not Star Trek. That's not. And I realize that that is evolving as we move into an era of streaming and we're no longer bound by network dictates for content as much. So who knows what we're going to see on Star Trek you know, streaming 
in the future. But, but it's interesting, too, because they said it's not censorship. It's a question of if you're writing Star Trek, you want to write yeah. Star Trek. And Star Trek is – people. so many people always wonder why Star Trek is endured, but it's pretty simple. We've, we've got characters that we've come to love, and also the show – is not only inclusive, but it, sh- it it purports to 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 see a positive vision of the future. So, I mean, it's 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 just not even about crossing lines. It's you push an envelope. Well, I mean, sometimes. it's just what's yeah, appropriate it's, for the format. I mean, I'm not going to write a right. I'm not going to write a Looney Tunes cartoon and have everybody blowing everybody's head off with shotguns. That's well, right. a bad right. example, but you know what I mean. I'm I'm not going to write a kids show <laughs> and then right. put in content that's inappropriate for that audience. It's not that Star Trek viewers are children, but they you know there is an expectation that certain lines certain types of story devices will not be employed. We're not Game of Thrones. You're not going to see the kind of stuff you see on Game of Thrones. You know, it's interesting. I, in, in the Crucible trilogy, which is the trilogy I wrote to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the original series, um, it's, the whole trilogy centered around the episode, The City on the Edge of Forever. And needless to say, Edith Keeler, the character of Edith Keeler, played by Joan Collins in the episode, was a part of that. And we actually, in my books, got to see a little bit more of her relationship with Kirk during the time Kirk was on Earth back in the 30s. And they had sex. <gasps> and, no. <laughs> right? I mean, I didn't write sex scenes, but I, I made it absolutely clear that Edith w- had no qualms about being in a romantic and sexual relationship. I got a lot of grief from some fans, <laughs> right? The editors had no problem with nobody it. Nobody had sex but... until the 1960s, right? That's nobody right. ever had That's sex right. until the 1960s. That's how I saw it on TV. So we just all well, shared I think it magically. Some people, some people took exception to the fact that in the credits of The City on Ninja Forever, Joan Collins is listed as Sister Edith Keeler. <laughs> Oops. Well. So, okay. yeah, well. But, um, you know, so, yeah, the, I mean, viewers, readers have an expectation and – um, yeah, you could, I guess that was pushing the envelope a little bit, but I think it was, it. you know, now if I'm writing explicit sex scenes between Kirk and Keeler, okay, now that just doesn't fit within what Star Trek is. So, you know, but it's interesting too, you know, as part of this whole process, our outlines, we, before we, we put word one down of a novel, we have to write an outline for two, re- for, for, well, for one reason, but for, for serving two masters. First of all, Simon & Schuster, in the guise of pocketbooks, right now has the licensing rights to publish Star Trek. And so when they're going to publish a Star Trek novel, they have to know before they're going to pay somebody to write a novel what, what that novel is going to look like. And they want to make sure that you're not crossing those lines and, and, and putting together a Star Trek story that's not really Star Trek. But also, CBS, who owns Star Trek right now, they also have to approve because they're the, the license owner. They have to say, yes, this is a story we want to see in, in, in the novels with our Star Trek name, brand, plastered over the cover. So, so we have to make sure, even before we begin writing a novel, that our story is, has been okayed by those two uh, big daddies. So on that level, how much... Um... Do do you generally get notes from CBS licensing if there's an issue or uh, does that just go to the editor and then that goes to you? Like, how does that whole relationship work there? Generally, it's uh, you give your outline to the editor. The editor sends it to the folks at CBS and then CBS will provide their feedback to the editor. It'll, it'll be just, you know, normally you don't really interact directly with licensing. Uh, right. In terms of, in terms editor, of story notes, it goes to the editor, yeah. Have you have you ever gotten story notes from CBS? Nothing extensive. I mean, I may have gotten a note, you know, an odd note here and there, like we would appreciate it if you didn't do this, or we would appreciate it if you explored this more. Um, yeah. But nothing like, oh, we don't like this. So I've never had. I don't think I've ever had anything. Well, that's not true. I may have had an SCE novel pitch rejected, but I'm yeah. Yeah, I've only had, I think, only two novels have ever gotten notes from from CBS. I've gotten minor um, stuff. And, it, and yeah. they were very minor, yeah. So uh, I think uh, John Van Sitter's over there. And uh, is Paula, Paula doing stuff now, too? Paula, I think, looks at a few things on a freelance basis. Yeah. Um, they're also, like like Margaret uh, uh, Clark, they're, they're, they're looking to put out Good material, uh, adult material, um, 
and and are supportive of the artists who are trying to create it. So um, I, I don't. I mean, it's weird to say I got no problem with licensing, but I, I absolutely don't. They they do a good job, I think, and they they do a good job not just for the writers. They do a good job for the fans, I think. Um, I mean, and I'm a fan, and so I want them to keep Star Trek, you know, not always exactly the same thing, but I want them to keep Star Trek, Star Trek, and not, you know, uh, Star Trek, Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah, um, they're also. I mean, the, the folks, the folks at licensing are also fans. I mean, John Van Sitters is as much a fan as any of us, and can totally stand toe to toe with anybody who wants to talk Star Trek trivia minutia. Um, <laughs> Paul Block is also well versed in this stuff, and yeah, so yeah. these are, and so they're, you know, we have the good fortune of having a licensing office who's engaged with the property on that level. So that helps because that certainly does cut down on the need for big drawn out explanations to a studio about why you want to do this with their property. Um, right. But as far as notes, I mean, I've gotten a couple of minor. When I say minor, I'm talking I fixed it at that afternoon. You know, that's, right, exactly. that's how, yeah. that's how quick it is. And as often as not, or more often than not, I get accepted with no changes requested. So, yeah, that's what I, um, that's mostly what I've gotten to, which yeah. I, 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 for a while I was thinking, are they actually reading these things? <laughs> no, but they I've read. Heard, yeah, they, yeah. yeah, they read. Yeah. But again, I think that's a product of several of us have been doing this for a very long time now. And yeah. so we've yep. got a rapport and a level of trust established with the license holders. And you can't buy that kind of thing. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's gold to have that sort of trust from, from a license owner. Uh, mm -hmm. Very empowering and very, very you know, motivating that they trust you enough with their toys to send you out and play. Knowing you're going to bring back mm -hmm. more or less how you left them. I believe that Star Trek, literary Star Trek is an exception. Um, I, I don't get the general feeling that this is the way it is with other media tie-in. I can, well, uh, I know for a fact it's not with all of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they might, yeah, they they might they might have somebody that they can reach out to. You know, Property X, you know, might have somebody that they can reach out to to talk about matters of continuity and whatnot. But in terms of an actual passion for the pro for the for the property and a protectiveness of the property, but yet a desire to see it explored in ways that you know that the a novel can do that a TV show can't. Um, very few properties, in my experience have the level of devotion that you see with the Star Trek folks. Um, but they're not going to go with an idea if you said, hey, I want to do a novel about the Enterprise E and the main character in this one is going to be an unknown crew member, like a lower no, deck. Of course not. You know. Oh, well, I mean, it depends. You know, it, it does depend. I mean, because we do have new characters that we've introduced into the mix that have replaced canon characters that have moved off for one reason or another. Um, the Enterprise you know, is a pretty decent example because several of the positions that used to be filled by characters from the show are now filled by characters that, that authors on the novels have created. And you know, we've had we've had storylines that focus in on some of these characters. Um, it, again, it's, it, it's it's going to be again. I guess the big the big driving answer to a lot of these questions is it depends. You know, it just depends on the project. It depends on the context. But but it's never. Unlike the old days, no is never the first answer. It's always going to be, well, that's interesting. Convince me, or I right. like this idea. Go for it. You know, it's it's never. It used to be you try if you were if you were to do that thirty years ago, you would have been an outright no without even a yeah. chance to explain your case. Now it's like, well, this is different. We haven't done anything like this before. Let's see where it goes. You know, and and yep. and they give you a chance to show you what you're trying to do. In fact, I've had more conversations where they just needed some clarification, and they go, oh, well, now I got what you're saying. Go ahead, go for it. Yeah, and it's it's like I said, it's it's very uh, very empowering to be able to do these sorts of things. So, kind of moving into uh, the next little thing that I want to talk about here, there's someone out there listening to this right now who has an amazing idea. They think for a Star Trek novel, how would they go about uh, pitching that idea to? Simon and Schuster, and like, what is the process for that? And do they stand a chance? Writing tie-ins is a hard job just by itself, and then you have to factor in the you know the reality that you're going to be working with other writers on occasion, where whose stories sync with yours or yours sync with them. And so, a lot of writers don't like working in that environment. They don't want to be collaborators. They want to work solo and do their own thing. So, writing tie-ins is already not the right place for you if that's if you can't if you're not interested in collaborating and giving and taking and realizing that you know your vision is not the only one out there for this type of story then you're going to have a hard time and then tie-ins are just 
insane when it comes to deadlines. I mean, the, the window of time that you get to write a tie-in novel is very short compared to what most people think it takes to write a regular. I mean, some people spend two years writing a novel. That's the, or, the, the, more. or more. And I mean, we're talking a first draft. Then they turn around and they start over and they write it again. Right. And then they write it again because somebody in a writing class told them they can't publish a novel until it's been rewritten 17 times or whatever the <laughs> hell it is that they're pushing these days. But, you know, when you're writing a tie in novel, you usually get between three and four months start to finish. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. if you're if, so the the right, the editors of these books are going to go with people that have established themselves as being able to hit a deadline. And they'd be able to write clean and who can take editorial direction without too much fuss. And that rules, believe it or not, that rules out a large percentage of people who claim to be writers. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. It, it, professional writers. Uh, it absolutely does. I was gonna, I'm also going to quibble with one thing or question one thing because you said if somebody has a, a killer idea. I, I, I don't want to sound arrogant about this, but ideas sort of don't matter. I mean, of course, ideas matter, but, but ideas are kind of a dime a dozen. The idea isn't what matter. A story matters. And there's a difference between, oh, I got an idea for a, a, a show where there's this the ship of, you know, 400 people, and they, they go out exploring the universe, they're meeting aliens. Okay, all right, that's an idea, and it's a worthy idea, but you got to put some meat on that bone, right? It, it, because execution is everything. Um, pe people come up with ideas all the time for a story, for, for, for a show or whatever, but the ideas have to be fleshed out. You, if you go into pitch to Star Trek, to the series, you have to, you can't go in and say, oh, I have this great idea. You have to go in and say, here's the beginning of my story. Here's the middle of my story. Here's the end of my story. Here are the ways the characters are going to grow. Here's where they're going to start. Here's where they're going to end up. Here's what's going to happen along the way. It's a there's a big difference between just an idea and a story. I, I attended a, a, a workshop one time that was taught by Richard Hatch, who was the actor on Battlestar Galactica, and he had written some novels. And I remember at the time he was saying you, you the way he was the way he approaches it is just, you know, just going with the flow, like, you know, one beat leads to the next beat, leads to the next beat, leads to the, like that. The story starts to inform itself. The characters start to carry the story. They have their own voice. It goes in that direction, which remind me a lot of like how I do improv, but do, do authors have different ways of approaching and writing or, you know, does, Oh yeah. Everybody's got a different process. Yeah. Um, if you have 10 writers they, and you ask their process, you'll get 12 different answers. <laughs> right. Um, Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, I, the hardest writing for me is the outline. You have to, for Simon and Schuster and for uh, CBS licensing with respect to Star Trek tie-in novels, you have to write an outline and it's a narrative. Well, I mean, not everybody writes narrative outlines. I, I know some people sort of write these crazy bullet I do. point I outlines. I mean, every, everybody writes different types of outlines. Yeah. How do, how, what do you do, Dave? I do a narrative. I basically just write a synopsis, a, 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 you yeah. know, a 12 to 15 page synopsis of my story from start to finish. I, yeah. And that's what I do. I, you, and you write, again, the beginning and the middle and the end and the, what the characters do and, and just the really broad strokes of the story, yeah. but in a way that somebody can tell what this thing is going to look like. I've discovered, I mean, for me, that's the hardest writing. Even though the novel takes longer, it's sort of easier. Because it's almost at that point filling in the blanks. Yeah, because you know still, generally where the road is. Yeah. Exactly, you've got your roadmap, and there's still plenty of room for creativity and for new things. And like you said, Dayton, sometimes you, you end up taking a left, a, left, a left turn you didn't expect, but it's just where the story leads you. But you have an idea. I've discovered as hard as that writing is, that is essential to my process, mm -hmm. and not just for Star Trek. When I'm writing other things. I write an outline. Mm -hmm. I've just discovered it works for me. Yep. There are plenty of writers who don't ever do that. Right. Uh, uh, but it's, you know, and I, yeah, but they make lousy tie-in writers. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, they certainly would make, they, yeah, they couldn't, they obviously clearly couldn't write. They, would, they, but, they, they likely would. I, would. I shouldn't, I shouldn't speak in absolutes. They might not make the best tie-in writer because of their process. They prefer to write. We used to, we, we call them pantsers. They write by the seat of their pants. And yeah. it's like, that's, there's nothing wrong with that kind of writing. You know, if, if that works for you, then more power to you. But if you're going to write for a licensed property, you have to learn that you're going to have to adapt to the other model. That's just the way it is. There's, um, there's some very famous writers, the the, uh, 
the Elmore Leonard's and the Stephen King's who are seat of their pants writers who don't, they're not writing yeah. outlines. They're just writing novels. And, you know, to the tune of, you know, however many millions of dollars say, they yeah. burn. I mean, they, they, and, and how they're great, tremendously popular and, and well-regarded by critics. It's it just, like I say, you get 10 writers, you get 12 different processes. But now, just for the sake of argument, or just for the sake of discussion, we'll go with the idea that somebody is trying to approach a publisher with a story. Let's say they've got a story. They've written out what they believe is a Star Trek story. Now, I don't know if these guidelines are still valid, but they used to have submission guidelines for Star Trek novels. And mm -hmm. it was, you had to have an agent. You had to have an agent who would, on your behalf, submit an outline and a three sample chapters of your novel to pocket books. Or it's not actually, now it's gallery books, but because uh, they've gone right. to the trade paperbacks. but it's So they would submit that on your behalf. And, and everybody would be like, why do I need an agent? It's like, well, you, you know, there's a lot of reasons why you need an agent. But for the one thing, if, if, if you can get your editor, if you can get your agent to believe in you to submit your story to a publisher, you've probably won a significant battle in terms of having somebody take your story seriously. Um, it's a way of separating the wheat from the chaff, or it's a firewall, however you want to look at it. Um, once you get in the door that way, an editor has a chance to look at your manuscript and, or your outline and your sample chapters. Here's the kicker for tie-ins. That story may not be the one you end up writing. Right. They may have looked at that as your audition. It's kind of like, it's sort of similar to what David was talking about when he sent his Quantum Leap script to a different show. As I, re, as I remember from olden days or older days, when you wanted to write for a TV show on a freelance basis, you submitted what was called a spec script, but you didn't send it as an episode of their show. You wrote something else and sent it to. So if you want to write Magnum PI, you sent them a MacGyver script. Or if you wanted to write right. MASH, you sent them an all in the family script or whatever. Yep. So you, you, you know, and that's how they, they judged your writing. They didn't judge your ability necessarily to tell a story with their characters. Hmm. Um, and then if they liked you enough, they would bring you into their room and you would maybe pitch a couple of ideas and they would give you a writing assignment. That's not the way writers rooms work anymore on TV. Well, by and large, it's, it's a, it's a group of established writers who work together and they, there's very little, if any freelancing. Uh, anymore. Uh, anyway, so for, for tie-in novels, if you get in the door, in a, all right, we'll go down two paths. They like your story, they like your outline, they like your sample chapters. So they send that to CBS. And if CBS likes it, that's when you get a contract offer to write the novel. Now, if they like, now, like I said, they might like you and they decided that you're, you can tell a story, but they're going to give you a different story because, again, these are live things that evolve with every book and they have ongoing storylines and they have characters who develop from book to book or even series to series. So they're going to find a story that lets you write within that framework of established lore. So you're not going to be able to just write your one-off standalone awesome Star Trek story necessarily. And even if you did, they're going to make you conf make your, make changes so that it can conform to the bigger picture. Um, that's how it used to go. Uh, I don't even know that they accept outside submissions right now. I have to look on that one. Don't because I don't I don't want to I don't want to say something incorrect, but I'm fairly certain they don't do that anymore. Yeah, I I, I couldn't say for sure either, but I, my impression is no. The last a couple of times I tried to find the guidelines out there, I could not find them on the website, and they used to be very prominent. Um, so I'm I'm susp now that's not to say you can't do it. What you'd have to do is find an agent that's willing to represent you with your tie-in novel, your Star Trek novel outline and sample chapters and who would still submit it to pocketbooks or I keep saying pocketbooks, I swear. I'm, it's going to take me years to make that switch um, <laughs> to Simon and Schuster who will then go through the process of submission and evaluation for you. But I would suggest too, I would suggest too that if you've never written a novel or even a short story or anything, um, I, I wouldn't start tie-ins in general. I don't want to say that you Star Trek media tie-in sh should, shouldn't be your first that, but your your first bit of writing shouldn't be is, is likely not going to be a professional sale. Writing, right. like any art, hard. takes practice. So you know, I mean, people sometimes think they can write because hey, I, I can sit at my computer and type the same way they think they can act. Oh, they're just walking and talking. I can walk and talk. But there's a whole lot more that goes on than just those aspects of those crafts. And so I, I think. If you have an idea or a story for a Star Trek novel, it would you would be better served if that came on the heels of the ten pieces of fan fiction that you've written or whatever, or, or things that you've written on your own that not necessarily fan fiction, but if you've practiced as a writer and and have honed your your craft, because they're going to want you to be a, a good writer. 
Yeah, they're going to, and, and that's comes back to, you know, it's, they're going to tie in editors and this is not just Star Trek. This is anybody. They're going to go with people who have demonstrated an ability to hit their marks, get their marks clean, easy to work with, or at least able to work with. Um, and, <laughs> and, and can do that on a, and can do that on a, you know, it's like, okay, I did it once. No. Okay. Well now do it again. Now do it again. Now do it three times in a row. Now do it five times in this one calendar year. Now do it while (laughs) dancing on your head and working with four other writers. I mean, it's, there are times when it's literally that crazy. Um, So they're going to go with people who have a track record of some kind. Um, That's unfortunately the way it works with a lot of these types of gigs. Editors are not going to waste a tie in slot on an unknown writer. They're going to want to see a track record. Um, There's just too much at stake and too many moving parts. And if it goes wrong, you know, then there's a lot of more, there's a lot more money and strife involved in fixing that problem. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Books that don't hit their deadlines and there are open slots. I know writers who have been called in to anonymously help other writers because it just all went off the rails, you know? Yeah. Um, and we're talking like a new writer or somebody who was struggling. It's, it's not a pretty sight. Um, it's not a pretty sight for anybody involved. And, and then, but also, if if you have a, if you're just starting out as a writer, write your own material, because number one, if you want to write a Star Trek novel, there's only one place to sell it. And right. if you want to write original fiction, then you just you have all kinds of options available to you that are not available to you if you're writing a tie-in. And if you want to write short fiction, you don't even need an agent. You just have to send it to the editor of that publication, and you just have to be better than the last story the guy read, and or the right. editor read, and you know, then you're in because they have to fill a monthly quota or however many quota, you know, quarterly or whatever their publication schedule is. They have to fill a roster, and you just have to be better than at least one of the people they read before you for that issue, <laughs> and boom, you're in. Um, so there's all you know, there's just like a lot more options available to you if you're writing your original fiction, tie-in fiction is a special animal that has a specific skill set. Um, and it's not easy. You know, if, if I, you know, I'm a baseball fan and I love the Mets, which is my own cross to bear. Um, <laughs> but if I was, if I was going to try to be a, a major league baseball player, I wouldn't expect to play with the Mets the first time I played professionally. <laughs> I would expect to go, you know, play in college and then play professionally in the minor leagues and single A, double A, triple A before making it to the major league. You have to you have to grow in your in your in your craft. You have to you have to to become good at what you do in order to do it in a in an absolutely a, a professional way in the highest levels. Right. And uh, I mean, there are, and they I'm sure knows this as well as I do. There are plenty of people out there who look down on tie-in novels, and. Um, I'll say that I certainly have read in my life tie-in novels where I can see why somebody would look down <laughs> on them because because yeah. somebody's just been a hack and has just you know thrown this thing together. I, I, had, I, had, I had somebody somebody who I who wrote I read this tie-in novel once and it was just dreadful. It was dreck, and I then subsequently several months later somewhere actually ended up surprisingly meeting the writer. And he confided, and I didn't say anything about the novel, even that I had read it, but he confided in me that he had written the novel in three days. I, I, I was aghast. <laughs> I, I mean, first of all, I don't even understand how somebody can type that many words in three days, um, let alone into coherent sentences. But they certainly couldn't do it in a way that provided uh, a, a good finished product. And so there are, there are hacks out there who are maybe they're just doing it for a paycheck or I, I don't know. But the people I know who write Star Trek are very diligent about it and uh, trying to write not just good Star Trek, but good novels. And I think the editors really ride herd on us pretty well. They they want to produce um, something that's not, quote unquote, just media tie in work that's actually worthy of being read, that, that have interesting themes and ideas and you know, expound, expand on the Star Trek universe. And I, I don't know. We, no, I mean, to, yeah, that's not to say that someone who's trying to break in for the first time can't bring that same passion and level of skill. It's just that the deck is stacked right. against them and it's, mm-hmm. yeah. it's through no fault of their own. It's just, that's, that's the reality in which tie-ins are produced and produces. But, also, yeah, if, they, they, but if they're writing, word, but it's they're, the best they're word. very, if they're writing their very first thing, it shouldn't. They shouldn't yeah. expect to publish a novel as their very first piece of writing. They should have been writing, 
you know, practicing their craft to get good. I mean, there are probably <laughs> people out there who, who whose first novel, uh, you know, the first thing they write is fantastic, but I think they're probably few and far between. But you and I have both met people who have implored us to help get their first Star Trek story published. <laughs> it's their first ever yeah. story or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and you have to smile and go, well, no, this is what's sort of your, what you're facing. It's heartbreaking. When somebody asks me how to do this when I get an email that, you know, and they're very, it's obvious that they're not just like trying to cash in or, or get right. rich quick or famous quick. They really do have a passion for this material and they do want to contribute in some meaningful way. And you have to tell them the unpleasant. It's heartbreaking. I don't want to break somebody's heart and ruin their dream. Right. That's not yeah. my job. I mean, granted, there might be times when I think it's a perk, but that's not true. I mean, I really, if it, <laughs> it's an, if it's a, if it's a, if it's an honest to God fan, who's just looking to make a mark and hoping to be a part of the ride, you know, it's like, it's really, it's really devastating to have to tell them the unpleasant reality. And uh, you know, cause I don't want to be that guy, but yeah, if you're, if you're starting out as a writer, tie-ins should not be your, your first place. You should be looking, you should try to build your, your writing credit, your writing, you know, your right, work, your craft, hone your craft, get a couple, ideally get some credits under your belt somewhere, professional credits, because that gives the editor a measurable track record. They can go, well, yeah, this guy published a, you know, a, you know, a science fiction novel where he, he's been writing short stories for analog for six years or whatever, whatever the thing is, but something that proves that you hit a mark and, and wrote something that an editor wanted to publish. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a key for writing in tie-ins. So doing a podcast about Star Trek books really isn't <laughs> going to help me. I don't think so, man. I'm sorry. Uh, now, now, and this is one of the reasons why I wish Strange New Worlds was still around in some mm -hmm. form, because yeah. I think that, well, I mean, obviously I have it to thank. And that's the, and don't, don't think I'm not aware for one minute that as I'm giving all this writing advice and all these ideas on how to succeed, that I didn't do a lot of that. I got lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the atypical example. I'm the worst example of how to do this, because it's not something you can recreate very easily. Um, a lot of people worked very hard for a long time before they landed a Star Trek novel contract. Um, I'm aware of that. Um, but you weren't just lucky. I mean, the circumstances were fortu fortuitous for you, but you delivered, right? You, you as didn't, somebody, the, first time as, you, as, yeah. the first time you wrote a Star Trek story, it wasn't for Strange New Worlds. You were just writing for yourself. Right. Yeah. I, so you were practicing and you were getting better at it. And then the Strange New Worlds contest came along and you were in the first three. I mean, you won each. I mean, you were in those first three volumes. And and what that tells me is, what that tells should tell anybody is Dayton knows what he's doing. That's what told the people who eventually hired you to do, well, SCE right. and then the novels. You delivered. So yes, the circumstances were fortuitous I guess. as I mean, were I mean, mine, <laughs> but you also a, delivered. A, there's an old saying out there that luck is where preparation and opportunity meet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I like to think that, yes, I was lucky, but it was, you know, by virtue of the fact that I'd been writing already to some degree and that prepared me enough to try to take a shot at this contest, which was the opportunity to be seen by somebody other than my friends. And the rest of it just happened. I mean, it, that, that I don't have any control after that. Everything that happened after that, as far as opportunities dangled in front of me, you know, they handed it to me, but I still had to go out and execute. And I'd like to think I'm doing something right because they keep calling me. Um, <laughs> so for whatever, and for however long that lasts. Um, but yeah, every, everybody has a different origin story. <laughs> I think is, yeah. you know, if you ask yeah. any of the writers who do this, it's like, yeah, we all came at from different angles and directions, but I think we can probably safely say that my route was atypical. So I guess uh, just kind of wrapping up, I'm going to ask, um, David, do you have anything on the go that our listeners would be interested in uh, hearing about in the coming days? Um, not in the coming days. I actually i am about to pitch um, a couple of projects full of non-Star Trek projects uh, and, um, and nothing I can really talk about right now. So <laughs> thanks for the ability uh the opportunity to advertise, but I don't really have anything I can speak about right now. So, but I'm sure Dayton does. <laughs> well, Dayton, I hear you've got uh, an interesting new kind of job role that you've recently come into, which uh, sounds really cool. Yeah. I wondered when that was going to come up. I tried to, <laughs> I tried not to bring it up. Um, no, it's fine. Um, I have been working for the past couple of months. I've been working as a consultant to, what used to be called CBS licensed products. Now it's called CBS global franchise management. Um, I am working for John Ben Sitters um, and I'm doing various 
review and advise duties with respect to um, tie-ins, and that includes novels, comics, games, what have you, that generally we're talking about those things that tie into Discovery, Picard, and any of the newer shows that are going to be in development through the new, you know, the new Star Trek group at Secret Hideout Productions. Um, but I'm also reviewing and advising on a couple of other things that are, don't fall into those bailiwicks um, on an as-needed basis. So uh, working with different licensing partners. It's been an interesting way to look at the process from the other side of the table. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, I did, some, I did some review and advise on Dave Gallanter's upcoming Discovery book. That was the first one that I really got to weigh in on. And then um, a couple of other things that are in the works that I can't talk about. And uh, my own work. Somebody else gets to look at my work. So don't be thinking I get to improve my own script. Or I was just going to say. I don't, get, I don't get to improve. I don't get, I, see, I don't, that's, that's it. They said, you're not going to be reviewing your own manuscripts, obviously. I said, look, I don't think I've made it as a writer until somebody else is writing my manuscripts. <laughs> so, and when we get to that level, that's when I'll start paying attention. Um, Dayton Ward's Forgotten History by some other guy. <laughs> so as part of this duty, I also review the scripts that are coming for, you know, the new Picard show and discovery season three and a few other things that are, that are in the works, the short treks and things like that. And then, so my job there is to be able to remain up to date so I can advise, you know, on tie-ins, but also identify potential tie-in opportunities, be they for a novel or a comic or a game or some other form of narrative uh, or storytelling approach. Uh, so it's, well, wait uh, a second. So can you reverse that? Can you go back to the people who wrote the script and say, no, this doesn't tie into my novels? No, they don't. <laughs> I, I don't advise on this shows. My role uh, is to help <laughs> Mr. Van Sitters with respect to tie-in opportunities, franchising or licensing opportunities. Those are, that's where that, that's my skill set. I don't have any desire to work for the shows because I don't have any screenwriting experience and I'm certainly not moving to LA. <laughs> uh, because, you know, look at me, <laughs> my temperament for, for LA is very low. Um, no, I'm, they, they want to keep me at a distance because like, I yell at people too much. Um, no, but I just, I mean, my skill set lies elsewhere. I mean, I've, I'm, a, I'm very passionate about the, the tie in world of novels and comics and, and things like that, that build on the Star Trek universe. That's where my passion lies in terms of wanting to shepherd it, guide it, protect it, nurture it champion it the whole thing so uh in that regard i like to think i'm a pretty good fit for this role which is fairly new it's never been done before at least for star trek so that's what i've been doing for the last couple of months while trying to write a novel and write a couple of thing other things on the side uh that i can't really get into with any too much detail um i'm going to be working again with modifius uh, to do some new material for the star trek role-playing game um and I'm also working on a set of trading cards for the Rittenhouse people that uh, do Star Trek trading cards. I'm doing the backs of the 100 cards that, that will be announced oh, cool. here soon. So, I mean, that was an interesting project that kind of came my way unexpectedly. Um, but as far as any other if, sport specific Star Trek projects I'm working on, I can't really get into any detail about anything. So, so yeah, Fair that's enough. been my life. That's been my life since April. I have to wait for, you either got to wait for San Diego or Las Vegas. I forget. I think it's Las Vegas where they're going to announce. A publishing schedule for 2020 and um oh exciting we'll definitely keep our ear to the ground for that and and bruce i think you're going to vegas is that right or uh no but i might now <laughs> <laughs> awesome well uh where can folks find you guys online to uh stalk you and and you know know what's coming out once you're able to announce it <laughs> well for me my website is drgiii.com drg dot com um and of course i'm on twitter and instagram and all all the social media they can find me usually is david r george the third or is drg i i i drg three um so uh yeah i'm 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 i've got my presence my internet presence i'm still at datemore.com which you know has my links to facebook twitter instagram and various other places where my writing might appear Perfect. Well, thank you guys so much for coming on. This was a really interesting discussion and uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. Yeah, me too. Maybe we'll read one of your books someday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nobody wants that. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks, thanks guys. guys. Yeah, thanks for, so yeah, much. Yeah, thanks a lot. 
I have to say that I love having those two guys on together and learning about the whole process. Some of this I knew. There was some new information in there that I didn't know. Um, I could have gone on longer because I have more questions, but we could have done it like all day because we'd be here for like five hours. <laughs> Absolutely. I. It was fun. It was two voices that we don't usually get together, you know, because, uh, you know, they haven't worked on a novel together before, but hearing kind of two experts in the field of Star Trek novels, just kind of talking about the process and, and the behind the scenes nuts and bolts of stuff without having to keep the discussion confined to a single novel or something like that. I think that was a lot of fun. And, you know, this whole episode was a bit of an experiment because we haven't really done anything like this before. And I think it was a successful one personally. I did too. And the one thing I learned is I am not ready to write a Star Trek novel, but I might be ready to do it if I do it with you, Dan. Ooh, there's a thought. I think, uh, me personally, I have to get a lot more writing under my belt before I give that a shot, but, uh, that could be a lot of fun. I do a lot of writing. I post on Facebook. I text people. I send <laughs> emails. I guess that doesn't yeah, count. Totally. No, that's, uh, yeah, we're going to maybe, uh, I don't know if you want to re-listen to that episode we just recorded there, Bruce. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Forget. Oh, we'll work on it. Anyway, <laughs> it's been a lot of fun talking about what it takes to make a Star Trek novel today. But it's not the only thing we've been discussing on the network. So here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on Trek FM. Previously on Trek.FM, The Ready Room. Tilly got a good launch. She had her subplot with, with May, which was the mycelial creation. Yeah. And she didn't come back. I that I just now realized that. She well, she went the, away with She didn't thought. come back because they they fell into the trap of using her as comic relief, which they do way too much. Yeah, yeah. Well The Edge, a Star Trek Discovery podcast. It's very similar to Sarek, you know, first wife, get a divorce, whatever, and then start a new family. That those siblings, and especially with that age gap, is not going to, you know, really remember or consider it a family. Mm -hmm. See, that's it. Amy just ruined canon on this show. Primitive Culture, a look at history and culture through Star Trek. Even that song, the way they sing it, I find it hilarious. You, you know, Terry Farrell clearly can't really be bothered to sing a song <laughs> as she's like almost speaking it. Uh, Avery <laughs> Brooks, meanwhile, just absolutely goes for it and sings it. Not only does he sing it, but he sings it in this That's, way. Yeah. Like, Hello, Marine, Hello, Marine, one, two, three. One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> Bizarre. I mean, like, I know he like when he when he does his singing later on in DS9. Yeah. He often he, he does sing. He has a, quite a high voice, given what a big kind of booming guy he is, and so on. But the, the, he like he doesn't just sing the song. Yeah. He kind of commits to. Uh, I'm doing a silly nursery rhyme. Dance he does commit. Thing. Yeah. The six oh two club. Yeah, it, like that scene on the plane was so meaningful to me. Dealing with that because it's like. Happy is just providing the equipment and saying go and letting Peter fiddle with it to create himself a new suit. But you see that the way that he's working with the computer, it's, you know, that computer screen that's projected into the air like Tony uses. And he's like grabbing things and moving them and zooming in and out and making like, you know, mannerisms and calculations like Tony always did when he was working on something with Jarvis. And you see Happy look at him and smile like a father looking at his son. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple eater, be sure to hit the subscribe. Oh, I'm sorry. If you're an Apple user, <laughs> I was kidding. Be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad, or Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they are published. And please leave us a star rating and written review. And if you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, YouTube, and most third-party apps. And you can stream and download the MP3 file for more 
our website or grab the RSS link. If you'd like to help us keep all of our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to get all of the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and more. And those are all available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us, and we hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and there's many ways you can do that. In the be- and the best place to join the conversation is in the Babel Conference, which is our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook, and it should come right up. And if you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select Literary Treks, and that will come right to us. And you can also find the network on Twitter at Trek FM and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Trek FM. And because we deal in books, we also have a Goodreads group where we have our bookshelves with all of our previously covered books as well as the currently reading section so you know what's coming up for future shows. Plus, there are great conversations happening about all of the books and comics. Just search for Literary Treks on Goodreads and click Join Group, and one of us will let you right in. We'd like to thank Norman C. Lau, Ken Tripp, Greg Rosier, Brandon Shea Justin Ozer, and Jeffrey Harlan for their support of the Trek FM network and for being associate producers for Literary Treks. Now, Bruce, when you're not submitting stories to Analog and all these other short story publications to try and get your foot in the door in the Star Trek publishing world, where can we find you? Well, you can find me on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex, where you can read all of my writings, (laughs) which don't (laughs) exist. And you can find me on the Star Wars Report podcast talking about Star Wars. And of course, I'm always in the Babel Conference. And Dan, when you're not busy practicing your writing and writing one story after another story after another story and posting them on your page, where can people find you? Well, you can find uh, my writings that are 280 characters or less on Twitter, which according to Dayton is probably not going to cut it. But on Twitter, I am there. I'm at Kurtrats. That's K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S. Uh, you can also find me on youtube.com slash Kurtrats Productions, where I talk about uh, all kinds of Star Trek stuff. I do do video reviews of new Star Trek novels as well, and those are the least watched videos on my channel. So oh, all no. you literary Treks listeners, go watch those videos. Get those numbers up. <laughs> I just like that you said do-do. Uh, oh, oh dear <laughs> and you can also find me on facebook.com slash Kurtrats Productions and of course in the Babel Conference well thank you everyone so much for listening and until next time live long and read on what do you call that light reading to each his own number one